Well, there's only really one place I can start with this episode, but thank you for all the support you've given me on the first five episodes of this series. You know, I've been very inconsistent, and uh, you've just shown me some incredible support. Uh, so, thank you very much. And uh, anyway, let's get on with the episode. That, that's all you're getting for the next 10 episodes. I'm only kidding. But if you want to click that like button and drop a subscription, please do. Because, you know, this is the only way I'm going to make more videos, really. I'm not really. I'm always going to make videos. You know that. In the last episode, we took on the Premier League leaders Liverpool at home. And uh, managed to secure a pretty good 0-0 draw at home. Although the problem is, is that every game I seem to have picked recently has been a draw. So I've decided, one, I'm going to pick some harder games. And two, I'm actually going to pick two games. So the chances of me losing or winning sort of increase. In before I go and draw both of those games now. But because the Liverpool game was just before deadline day, I'm going to focus this majority of the episode on transfers. Uh, and the priority was to find a goalkeeper. As I was saying, Jack Botland was the one we wanted. And we had a bid accepted for 27 million plus Sabiri. And I offered him a contract. He didn't get back to me till deadline day. I gave him the contract on the 22nd of January. How comes it took him nine days to give me a decision? What, was he making a film about it like Antoine Griezmann did once? We did look at options for midfield as well. And I looked at bringing in Ramirez on loan and Tom Cleviesta in from Watford. But I realised that Tom Cleviesta probably isn't the player we need at the moment. But we will be together again someday, Tom. We will be. Carl and Grant has also left the club and joined Swansea for 3.7 million, which is fantastic news for me because he was an absolute arsehole. Bayern Munich also rejected our loan bid for Serge Gnabry, which is great news for any Chris Brunt fans out there because he has more chance of playing again. We got desperate on deadline day, and because Butland hadn't actually got back to me at this time on deadline day, I put in a bid of nearly £32 million for Dynamo Zagreb's Dominic Libakovic, who's a goalkeeper who's 24. Apparently he had conceded like 11 goals in the season they rejected it and well that was the end of that basically that was the end of that transfer and for those wondering how are you getting this amount of money proudly well i was basically offering them 2 million up front and then offering them 30 million over three seasons we'll spread the cost we'll spread the cost like little woods it's like Little Woods. I have a credit card with him. Unfortunately, the Jack Botland transfer was then cancelled on deadline day because we didn't have enough money in the bank to buy him. So that's not gone well. Oh, wait, hold on. The media team have just got back to me. Apparently, they've just made the video for one of our first signings. But I am delighted to announce our first signing of the January trans window. And on deadline day as well, and I've panicked. And this is probably a goalkeeper a lot of you are familiar with. But Predrad Aradjkovic joins us from Maccabi Tel Aviv for £7 million. I may have overspent there. I'm not sure how much he's worth, and I don't know how much people are getting him for, but I have signed him on a four-year deal, and yeah, as I said, I panicked. I uh, couldn't really find anyone who was good enough. I mean, I'm not spending £27 million on Jack Butland. He's a championship player. I know he's an England international, but he's a championship player. It was on to the strikers, and I did need one because Carl and Grant had left, and I looked at Marvin Sordell, and I thought to myself, you know what? I've signed him in every series I've really done. I think maybe it's time to give him a break. But I'll put in a loan bid for him just in case, in case he wanted to come back home. Oh, wait, hold on. No, the media team have got back to me again. Apparently, we've just confirmed our second signing. But I am delighted to announce that we have signed a striker and, uh, well, another familiar name to a lot of you. Uh, he's just recently retired. And uh, joining us from Burnley for £12,000 is Peter Crouch. And, uh, well, do I really know what I'm doing anymore? I, I don't think I really know what I'm doing anymore. Uh, someone actually suggested Shane Long as well, and uh, he ended up going abroad. So, uh, sorry about that, whoever suggested Shane Long, but he's not joining us. So, I've just gone for the next best option. I mean, Shane Long is 5'5", five five and Peter Crouch is 6'7", so they don't technically play the same role. So, I'll sign Peter Crouch and just went to look at his profile, I've realised I've given him a two and a half year contract. I was only meant to give him a contract till the end of the year. Ah, sh In probably one of the biggest panic buys I've seen in the transfer window, Arsenal signed up Ryan Bertrand from Southampton for £31 million. And people say English players are overpriced. We also made a late loan bid for Sergio Gomez from Borussia Dortmund. That failed because I left it until 45 minutes before deadline day to make the signing. Abdel Hamid Sabiru was also unhappy with me because I didn't sell him. or I didn't sell him at all in the transfer window. Even though I tried to get rid of him 20 times in the Jack Butland deal. 
And unfortunately, Carl and Grant kept ruining it. And also, it didn't help that Sabiri had literally zero interest. I mean, it's like looking at my own Tinder. Peter Crouch has also started off his Huddersfield career on the right foot by getting the flu and being out for nine days. And Christopher Shinla was wanted by Jiangsu in China, but I rejected a bit because if I got rid of Christopher Shinla 12 days after deadline day, well, we would only have two fit centre-backs for the rest of the season. And I don't really want to be in that situation. But finally, after all that transfer news, we can talk about the results I've had recently. Although, technically, I don't really want to be talking about them because they've been awful. Uh, but we did get one win, at least in the last four games, over Everton at home. Uh, thankfully, Philip Billing scored a goal which uh, hit Pickford and then went into the back of the net off his back. So that's gone well. In the game against Crystal Palace away, Rajkovic actually saved a penalty. Uh, when we were 2-1 down, which is fantastic news. Although only five minutes later, he then conceded this long-range strike to Jordan Ayew. Not great goalkeeping, I have to admit. I mean, we signed Rajkovic and we've conceded more goals than when we had Jonas Lursi on goal. But in this episode, we do take on Wolverhampton Wanderers at home and Manchester United away. Manchester United are about to hit top of the table while Wolves are just outside the European places. So I've picked two more difficult games, I would say. And in terms of the league table, we're only one point off safety. Uh, Newcastle United currently holding 17th spot while we're in 18th. I mean, it's not going to go great. That's all I'm going to say. But anyway, we move into our first game of the episode at home to Wolverhampton Wanderers. And uh, there's been a change to the system and a few changes to personnel as well. But first of all, Predrad Radjkovic makes his debut on the series, replacing Jonas Lursil in goal. Well, in the series, not in goal. I mean, he did that like seven games ago. Uh, the defense pretty much stays the same, so that's no change there. But we have gone with four in midfield, so we're going with a 4-4-2 in this game. Uh, Aaron Moy returns to the series alongside Philip Billing. Chris Brunn on the left wing with Juninho Bakuna on the right. And then it means that up front Steve Mounier finally gets a partner with Adama Diakabe playing up top with him. Peter Crouch is also on the bench just in case I need him. Bear in mind that Huddersfield managed to beat Wolves both home and away last season in the Premier League. So I'm under a bit of pressure because if I don't get at least one win against them then they're doing better than I did. And I'm doing better than they did in real life. I mean that is a tongue twister. I mean it's not really. I just, I just can't speak properly. It took about 13 seconds into the game when I realised that I probably needed to make a tactical change and then decided not to. But Wolves had the first chance of the match only a minute inside and Divock Origi shot wide from about 25 yards out. And this is where I thought maybe this is going to be a very difficult game because if they're getting a chance within a minute of the match kicking off, this isn't going to be pretty. Wolves did fashion another chance after 15 minutes as Jack Clark was found on the right wing and put across into the box for Oliver Skip to head over. Yeah, they've had two chances already. They're bound to score first. But a few seconds after we had a corner, Christopher Schindler found Chris Lerver on the right wing and using his weak foot, crossed the ball into the box for Steve Mounier to give us the lead and uh, score a yet another goal this season. I mean, he's got eight this season, so I don't know why I'm making him sound like he's a 30-goal season striker, but he is the best striker in the world. Sorry, Marvin. <laughs> Wolves then got the ball in the back of the net as Jack Clark shot fan Jimenez who put the ball into the back of the net, but he was offside. And yes, this time he was actually offside. Not like Diakabi in the last episode. And talking of Diakabi, he headed over from an Aaron Moy cross just a few minutes before half time, and we took the lead into half time. I mean, there's a shock already. Divo Karigi had the first chance of the second half once again, and this time Radzkovic managed to save it and push it wide of the post. A great sign in already by Christopher Proud. And then it was time for Crouchy. I decided to bring him onto the pitch for Diakabi, and uh, then he passed the ball really well before we lost the ball, and then they scored. Brilliant. After Philip Billing was injured and then I sent on Danny Williams to replace him, I was about to send on Christian Pavon for Chris Brunt before Juninho Bakuna then got himself sent off, which meant that Chris Brunt stayed on the pitch and then Pavon came for Peter Crouch. A great debut for Peter. Just the 15 minutes this week, but I'm sure he'll get some game time against Manchester United in the next match. But despite being down to 10 men, we were taking the game towards and Steve Mounier went on a run by himself he was the only one up front and uh, managed to put the shot wide which I thought well there we go we're gonna take the 1-1 draw at least with 10 men oh sorry did I say 10 men oh sorry I'm in nine men because Jorgensen then got himself sent off and then I ended up playing this 4-2-1-1 formation I mean Chris Brunt now playing as a number 10 you love to see it and also because I had no players on the pitch that could play as a defender it meant that Christian Pavon ended up at right back and amazingly because it took so long for Jorgensen to be sent off Wolves couldn't even find a winner so we drew 1-1 with nine men Oh, brilliant. Another draw. 
five in a row now. But here we go. Manchester United away and they've literally just hit top spot and I've got injuries and suspensions to deal with. It's not going to go well. <laughs> I'm in danger. But Radjkovic obviously keeps his place in goal. He's the best goalkeeper we have now. The defence sees one change and with Jorgensen suspended, it means Terence Congolo comes into centre-back. The midfield sees a few changes. Elias Kachunga replacing the suspended Bakuna while Danny Williams replacing the injured Philip Billing. And the strikers are still the same because Steve Mooney and Adam the Akabe are the only two we really have. Peter Crouch is also on the bench if you really cared. As long as we don't lose 8 0, I'll be happy. The first highlight went to Manchester United and Ander Herrera scored after three minutes. Okay, the only way is up from here now. Okay, maybe it isn't then. Some superb defending in the centre of the park also allowed Andreas Pereira to make it 3-0 to Manchester United uh, about half an hour into the game. And then in the second half, he had a header save by Radjkovic, but then put in the rebound and we were 4-0 down. Yeah, this is definitely going to end more than 8-0. But we did have a few chances. Steve Mounier heading wide from a Tommy Smith cross. And then Antonio Valencia's header was picked up by Steve Mounier, who volleyed in probably the best consolation goal I've ever seen. If anyone's ever scored a better one, then you're lying to me because no one has ever scored a better one than that. And thankfully, that was literally the only highlight left of the game. We lost 4-1. We're back. And finally, I haven't drawn a game. Well, I mean, I did pick the hardest game of the season not to draw a game. Why am I doing this to myself? Do the Harlem shit.